Hello, Evie Sats. Hope you're having a great day. Um, today we are starting chapter four. Um, typically this section I do in class um, with an activity, but uh, just so that you have the basic information, um, I'm going to kind of run through the, the little details, uh, hopefully quickly. I don't know. I tend to talk more than I think I'm going to, but whatever. We'll see. Um, okay, so chapter four is all about um, experiments, experimental design, um, observational studies. Um, basically, like, how do you experiment and how do you survey well? Um, so 4.1 um, is basically giving you some terminology. So um, identifying population and sample. Um, identifying like different different ways of sampling that can lead to bias um, or like like bad results basically um, and then we may talk about how to use table D in this video if we don't get to it in this video it'll be in the next um, as a uh, table D is like the is a list of random numbers that you can use as like a sampling method so, suppose we wanted to find out what percent of young drivers ages 16 to 24 in the United States, which is important, and I left it out, so I just wrote it in there, um, text while they're driving. So, to answer this question, we can survey or interview several 16 to 24-year-olds. Ideally, um, you really want to talk to every single person in the United States who's within that age group who drives. Um, but realistically, that doesn't work because it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. Um, and so instead, we take a sample that should be representative of the population that we're interested in. Okay, note that like the sample should be representative of the population, okay? There are sometimes, right, we can do surveys poorly um, or sample things poorly so that they don't actually represent the true values of a population or the true nature of a population. Um, and that leads us to make like bad conclusions and a lot of times that can be really really dangerous. So we, we want to make sure that our, our sampling methods are sound so that our sample is actually representative of, of the population. Um, so basically, your population is the um, group of people or um, group of rabbits or type of flower you're interested in studying. Um, it can be anything, right? You can study anything in the world, which is why stats is super awesome. Um, but the population is like what you're actually interested in knowing information about. And then the sample is like the smaller group that you actually study. Um, just like it's a sample, like an ice cream sample. You sample the ice cream before you buy a whole thing of ice cream. Okay, so there's your kind of formal definitions. Um, so there's, I found this like little flow ch chart that I totally stole from online, but um, I don't love it, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of like how sampling happens. So basically you have, I'm gonna actually start from the bottom because I think it actually makes more sense that way. But so you basically have um, the people who are actually in your study. So the people that you're like talking to or researching or experimenting on or you know whatever you're doing with them, observing them, whatever it may be. And those people that you're like face to face with and studying, that is your sample. Okay, next begs the question, like how do I actually find these people? Um, and that is like your, the method of sampling that you use. Um, in this flowchart, it's called the sampling frame, um, but I actually don't really like that terminology. I don't use it in my class or anything. Um, I would just say, method of sampling. As we get further in this chapter, you'll learn the other, the other types of um, sampling, but this would include like simple random sample, uh, stratified random sample, um, cluster random sampling, you know, those 
which you will learn later. Um, there's lots of different ways you can sample. So anyways, um, then basically based off of the way that you sampled um, and the sample that you got, you can, you may or may not be able to make inferences or con conclusions about a certain population. Now that population may or may not be different from the population you're actually interested in. But the problem is, and where people do stats poorly and experimenting poorly, is if they say, hmm, I really want to study all the people in the United States, um, you know, all the drivers 16 and 24 in the United States, and they only sample people driving in Colorado. Um, you cannot make conclusions about people in the United States because you've only taken a sample from Colorado. So, so your actual study population is Colorado drivers. Um, even though your theoretical population, which is what you really wanted, and that's what goes up here, um, was United States drivers, but you cannot make conclusions about that because of the way that you sampled. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, a couple examples. Um, in the following, identify the population and the sample in each of the following. So go ahead, read those, see if you can figure out which one, what is the sample and what is the population. Okay, in problem one, um, this Mr. Mundy uh, decides he wants to study the population of students at Dawson who've taken an AP by the time they graduate. He collects 176 responses from Dawson alum uh, by sending out an email requesting the information. So the population in this uh, situation is um, the true proportion of students at Dawson who have taken an AP by the time they graduate, okay? Um, and then the sample is the 176 responses that he gets. Um, and then in the second one, you have Mr. Lord interested in finding out what the average number of pages read by high school students each week, each night actually is. He randomly selects 55 students in his, Dr. Weeks, and Dr. Hecox's classes, okay? Um, so the true population is the actual average number of pages read by high school students. Um, and so in that case, you know, that would be taking every single person who attends the school and getting the true number of pages and then averaging them and finding the mean. Um, and then uh, the sample is the 55 students that uh, he receives information from. Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit about like good sampling versus bad sampling. So good sampling should get you a sample, should result in a sample that is truly representative of the population. And basically, bad sampling does not do that. Um, and oftentimes you'll get like results that are skewed one direction or the other because you had a bad sampling method. Okay. Um, you will get bias, biased results, um, or <clears throat> a biased, um, just, yeah, biased results. Um, res basically what it means is like you'll have um, results that tend to favor a certain side just because of the way you worded it or the way that you sent um you know, the way that you got the information or um, who, who you ended up sampling. Um, and we'll talk more about like how you, how to reduce bias and like where those instances of bias come in. Um, <clears throat> but a very, very common way that, that you see a lot is in wording. Um, and we'll see a couple examples of that uh, as well in the future. And the last two vocab words, um, our, our convenience sample and voluntary response sample. And basically these are two examples of ways to get biased results, ways to have like really bad studies. Um, a convenience sample is basically like sampling the people who are easiest to study. So if you're interested in how students, how much time students spend doing work and you only stand outside of the CU library uh, and interview people. Um, it's convenient because you get to stand in front of the library, you just like ask people questions. Uh, but the people that you're asking questions to 
probably tend to like they might tend to study more because you're in front of a library um, and a voluntary response sample is basically like if uh, the, the responses that you get I mean it's kind of self-explanatory but the responses that you get are voluntary so um, this includes online polls um, this includes like news websites or um, uh, news stations that say oh call in if you want to respond to this question um, because there's typically a certain type of person who watches that particular show and so for example CNN and Fox right if both so CNN tends to be biased liberally and Fox tends to be um, biased uh, uh, conservatively and so if <clears throat> either one of them say for example Fox put up a question and said like how do you feel about Obamacare um, and people got to call in uh, the people who respond are the people who feel the strongest um, either way. So, so you're going to get people who are like, I feel really strongly against Obamacare and I feel really strongly for Obamacare. Um, but you won't really get like the moderate views from that. Um, and oftentimes, like if it's on a news station like Fox, like the people who are watching are going to tend to have conservative views. And so you will have a conservative response. And so that will not be a reliable study, um, even though they claim it to be. Uh, and you just, you can't, you can't believe those results. You just absolutely cannot. In fact, if you do believe those results, it's something called confirmation bias. This is not a statistical thing, but it's called confirmation bias. When you see results that you think are true and you believe them to be true, just because you're confirming your own ideas. <clears throat> so we want you to be critical thinkers of the world. And even if you are conservative and you're watching Fox or you're a liberal and you're watching CNN, read, you know, or anywhere in the middle, read the studies and really pick them apart and question yourself, question your beliefs, no matter what. Um, that is the best way to learn about the world that we live in and the best way to be critical of it um, is to assume that everybody's out to get, you know, everybody has an agenda. Okay, uh, so here's a couple examples um, of uh, <clears throat> different sampling methods. Um, if they're good, um, you could just say, like, this is a good way to sample. Um, if they're bad, describe why, um, what kind of a bias you might have, um, and uh, which direction the bias might be. Okay, so a little spoon sample of ice cream at an ice cream shop. That should, in theory, be a good sample because what you're doing is like you're testing it and you're like, mmm, I like pistachio ice cream. And, um, and you decide to get an entire like bowl or cone of, of that type of ice cream because you liked the sample um, and you would be pretty darn upset if the sample tasted nothing like the actual cone that you got. Um, so that little sample should be representative of like the actual bucket of ice cream when it comes out of. Uh, so that should be good. <clears throat> B says you want to find out what percent of the population likes ice cream in the U.S. So you go to several randomly selected ice cream shops and survey everyone who walks in. Well, this is bad sampling because um, it's a convenience sample and you're going to tend to have results um, that are stronger towards the positive, i.e. you'll have people who like ice cream more just because you're in front of an ice cream shop. The next three are all voluntary response. So you absolutely cannot use the results from the survey. They're all going to be biased to like the strongest opinions. Uh, and read my responses for more details. And last is a tip for the AP. Um, so anytime you're asked to describe how the design of study leads to bias, you are also expected to identify the direction of the bias. So for example, if you know that the poll came from CNN, you have to say that it you believe that it's going to have a more liberal view. So the direction is just as important as saying that it's biased. Nice job!